Uh, I wanted to thank uh, Barack Obama for introducing the topic. I don't know if any of you saw in the newspaper today, but this whole topic of concussion and, and the burgeoning field of sports neurology is becoming a focus uh, everywhere. So we're really lucky today to have somebody who's an expert in the field come to talk to us. It's Dr. Tanzi Shams, and he is an overachiever by any standard. Uh, having finished his pediatric residency in New York and then also your, uh, your key neurology residency at Columbia University, he has been tireless and passionate about getting involved in sports neurology and concussion, has published a number of research papers and spoken everywhere. Uh, and that's not an annoying enough, he's also a fine man. <laughs> so, uh, give him a warm welcome and your patience. He's going to be screaming at you for a little while. I'll get you some water. Uh, and please welcome Dr. Tommy Chen. All right. I'm so thankful that so to be here. Um, so, that, you know, as I was driving here, I got two text messages that said, hey, the Obamas are having a summit in, in the White House. You know, can we put you in? And I said, all right, I'll think about it because I go to the store sure. <laughs> Short on time. Um, so typically, the audience that's usually listening to concussion talks are, it, it's either I give talks to a general public audience at colleges, universities, high school, that kind of setting, or it's a group of neurologists who are kind of looking at really um, specific aspects of the concussion science. Uh, this topic, I try to make sure, you know, like I said, you, unless you're living under the rockets, you see some sort of media exposure, some sort of story about it. So instead of kind of delving into one nitty gritty area like you know, neuroimaging and brain trauma, what I try to do is make this talk into six or seven small modules. And the point is, at each one of these sections, I try to give you content so that you can think critically. And when you're list listening to a news story or looking at a paper, you kind of about the topic. All right, uh, so let's move forward. Um, and just another kind of big picture thought. Um, I, I personally, if, I think there are probably some practitioners here who were around when, let's say, the HIV virus or the HIV AIDS um, was first kind of came to the forefront. A similar phenomenon comes to mind when we talk about this, right? Because this idea of concussion, brain trauma, sports concussion, it's everywhere, except what the phenomenon is, and so many of the questions are still quite not, not defined. So I think it's best for us to think of this as an evolving topic and something we're going to learn more and more about as we, as we go forward. All right, so the first 10 minutes is going to be some historic context and, and also uh, overview. You know, obviously this topic came to prominence because of several NFL players, you know, presenting very early onset dementia, altered mental status, erratic behavior, and so on. But once again, I think the historic perspective is important. If you step back, I mean, is it the case that the general community or the sporting community didn't know about concussion? It wasn't the case. You know, all along, people who've been in the front lines in athletic training room embedded in the sporting community have known that repetitive head trauma had some detrimental effect on individuals. This is a paper from JAMA, 1928, an internal medicine physician from Newark. He had published a paper, if you look at the Second paragraph, he described the phenomenon of being punched drunk. He was assessing boxers who were either, they were kind of fill-ins, they were training boxers, so whoever the prize fighters were used to fight with these individuals, and he's describing the phenomenon of being punched drunk. Most often it affects fighters who are the slugging type, who are usually poor boxers who take a considerable punishment, seeking only to let a knockout blow. Um, I'll move forward a little bit here, let's see. All right, and in the same paper, um, and he kind of publishes a, a biopsy sample of a 38-year-old fighter who had passed away. Uh, I just want to draw your attention to this region's internal capsule. You'll start to see punctate lesions on both sides. And just take a snap, take a mental snapshot of this, all of these punctate lesions on my own line. And then if you fast forward, one of the major centers that have really put this story forward. Uh, and it comes out of Boston, comes out of Massachusetts, right? There's a long-term framing at Carson study. So the chief pathologist for that study is Anne McKee. Over the last 10 years or so, this group in the year, they were able to collect uh, a set of brain banks from, well, initially it started with former retired and well players, but they started to see some pathological changes in these places. It's a small sample set, 
But I think for our group, just so that we have a, a stage and a common foundation, so first, just look at what they were seeing under the pathology slides. Has, has anyone seen these slides, these cross sections in any kind of talk before? You know, this is, this is what really broke the story and then kind of put everything in the, in the forefront. Uh, so I'll point out three phenomena: uh, neuronal loss and gliosis, uh, tau deposition, and deposition of beta beta amyloid. This is 65 a slide of a 65 year old man with an H and E stain. If you look forward, this is one of the early samples that they had. These brown discolorations here in the temporal region around the hippocampus and so on are really tau depositions. Then note the age here: a 45 year old who had committed early. <coughs> Early, I think he had he had committed suicide along the cortical. Cort you can see cortical distribution of tau deposition and also in the parenchyma, neurofibrillary tangles, and so on. And then this is also one of their early. Well, uh, as the brain bank was collecting data, this is an 18-year-old. Once again, some perivascular deposition. So compare this image to the 1928 data published by Harrison Martin, perivascular deposition, and, and so on. And I, I thought this is an interesting thing, right? If you have a 82-year-old, 45-year-old, and now an 18-year-old with brain samples that are showing perivascular tau depositions and tau depositions in parts of the brain that are involved in memory and cognitive functions and so on, you know, the, the big picture question is that what's happening to hundreds and thousands of young individuals who either through sports or through some other context are exposed to repetitive head trauma. Uh, this we could be talking about individuals in the military, we could be talking about individuals who are uh, participating in high school sports, and so on. And then further questions about if the end stage is this phenomenon of top positions and overall encephalopathy, where does it start, and how much head trauma does it does it give you there? This whole spectrum is not quite clear. Then we have the endpoint. If, if we accept the fact that hey, you know, how their position and chronic traumatic encephalopathy to describe the outcome. But where does it start, and how much how much head trauma is required? You know, to what extent do individuals progress? How fast they progress? All of that are really broad questions that we're, we're thinking about and looking at. So I hope that, that kind of gives you a, a foundation. So I'll move to a couple of modules, and you know, as you look at each news story or any paper that comes out, please apply some of these principles when you think about it. Can you guys hear me in the back? You know, I'm just getting kind of warmed up, kind of project. Yes. Okay. Good. Um, so we'll start with the epidemiologist. No. The answer is no. Oh, the answer is no. Okay. All right. So from an epidemiological point of view, one of the main questions that that come up is. Is concussion overreported or is concussion underreported? Right. Um, the the Center for Disease Control they estimate each year there's about four million sports-related concussion if you tally up all the junior high, high school, and collegiate athletes. On the other hand, there was a very interesting study that came out of NYU. They did a longitudinal study for five seasons in ten colleges, and one of the key questions they had asked the athletes was that. Do you feel comfortable reporting their own concussions? And I, I, I believe, yeah, 23, close to 25% of the patients said, no, I don't. So I think the jury's out. Is concussion overreported or underreported? We, we don't necessarily know the answer. It does compose a very large portion of athletic injury, about 8.9% of high school sports related injuries, 19% of uh, football injuries, and about 5.8% of other sports related injuries. Um, one of the terms I wanted to introduce, and this is very commonly used in athletic literature and sports medicine literature, but you may not be familiar with, is if you're looking at concussion epidemiology, how do you compare a soccer game that's 90 minutes long and a basketball game that might have four halves that are 15 minutes each or two 30 minute halves? How do you compare incidents of concussions? from one sport to another. So the common denominator that was agreed upon is athlete exposure. This term is used in kind of universally in literature to you, you consider one practice or one game as the common denominator time and then count the number of so It gives you some sort of common um, language to speak about incidences of concussion. So if you look at athlete exposures, you know, these are the sports that really come up. Not, not too many surprises if you break down between 
helped with not only sports with in contact sports, football, ice hockey, men's lacrosse, they come up on top with the helmet sports, and then wrestling, men's, men's soccer, women's soccer come towards the top in not helmet sports. Uh, nonetheless, you know, I, I think concussion reporting is still uh, a, a major issue. You know, uh, some numbers from high school football players and women's high school soccer players. There's, if you think about the psychology of a high school athlete who's very excited to participate in the game, Despite how much media coverage there is, despite how much education has gone in during the last four or five years in teaching coaches, athletic trainers, there's still a burden on a very young person to come forward and say, hey, I'm having a headache, I'm having a uh, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, and I, I'd like to sit out this season. I think this is still uh, a very uh, understudied area of, of behavior and, and, and psychology in the concussion field. And what, why don't we? You know, what can cause that behavior change? You know, it remains to be seen. Um, it does happen, you know, we think of football and uh, soccer, lacrosse, rugby, but mixed martial arts, gymnastics, equestrian sports, skateboarding, which has a long culture of not wearing a helmet, um, snowboarding, all of these sports, it, it really comes up and it makes the epidemiology that much more challenging. Um, so, Keeping that epidemiology background, in the next subsection, so to speak, I wanted to talk about how do we define how do we define sports concussion, right? So one could make the case uh, is is all brain trauma equal. So this this is also a very divided and polarized topic. You know, what's galvanized the storyline is sports concussion because it the story is you know some of the Pathology slides, as we saw, came out of retired NFL players. At the same time, people have brain trauma in all sorts of settings. Somebody who falls in the back of their head, somebody who's in a motor vehicle accident, they have head trauma all the time. So can we talk about sports concussion and head trauma like interchangeably? And in the past, there was a great gradation, mild, moderate, severe. So let's let's look at at least the sports medicine community would like to define it a little bit differently. Every four years, there's kind of an international consortium that combines FIFA, NHL, and NFL, the largest sporting governing bodies. And they were really trying to make a point that it's, concussion is a complex pathophysiological process there that has biomechanical component that's a little bit different than your annual head trauma. So, and I'll let's go forward a little bit here. So if you look at this image, you know, in a blast injury, you a soldier who perhaps stepped you know, onto a mine and uh, there's a bomb explosion. You know, so some researchers can make the case that it's, it's a, when, when there's a blast injury or a motor vehicle accident, you usually go to the R then you so you get the classic coup, counter coup injury. On the other hand, in an athletic setting, most of the time, the movements are a little more dynamic. Sometimes you don't have to have a hit to the head in order to experience concussion symptoms. It can be a blow to the body. And there's also a good amount of rotational force and, and tor torque involved in athletic settings that, you know, one could say the pattern of head trauma and symptoms that develop as a result of more dynamic and more rotational forces could be something different. Um, and if you look at the brain anatomy, just a simple analogy, if you think of the brain stem as a stock and the entire brain kind of swiveling around it, if there's a rotational force acting on it, the, the sheer injury and the pattern of distribution tends to be a little bit different, um, usually in the brain stem, usually in the corpus callosum, in addition to the frontal and occipital injuries that we see in you know, some of these are areas that are that, that show up. So if it's a question that comes up. You know, I just wanted to kind of share this concept with you to kind of think about, it, it's a raging debate whether a sports concussion should be categorized differently than any other any other head trauma. Great, so I'm moving fast. Everyone with me so far? Yes, good. All right, so next module, we'll talk about um, kind of a pathophysiological model for, for brain trauma. Um, uh, let's see. Okay, so so we have all these clinical presentations, right? You, at each each season, a certain number of high school athletes will experience sports concussions and so on. But for as long as there has been head trauma, there's been a push from uh, 
individuals who study head trauma in, in rat models kind of come up with an overarching model. So back in 2001, there was a landmark paper published by Christopher Tiza uh, from UCLA and, and uh, Dr. Hobda. They, they put forward a paper. It's they, At this point, this model functions as kind of a standard for head trauma. So I'll go through the model, and then we'll talk a little bit about the limitations of this model. So the reason why this is important is because you have a clinical phenomenon of concussion where people have signs and symptoms for a prolonged period. But in a, in a laboratory setting, in a rat model, there's, there's a time paradox that come up and we'll talk about it. So three stages, acute, intermittent, and late. Um, okay, so at the very first phase of this uh, head trauma, or, I mean, this is basically looking at metabolic derangements in rat brain by applying, directly applying impact force to the frontal lobe and so on. Um, so first phase, the first few seconds to minutes, major metabolic derangements, the trauma causes axonal stretching, you have indiscriminate re release of excitatory neurotransmitter. So what's happening at the very, very early on is that you get a rapid rise in extracellular potassium and also a rapid rise in calcium. Secondarily, this rise in calcium, the, the cell bodies that go into a high metabolic demand where you're using the ATP pump to get the potassium back in. So immediately afterwards, you get a downward trend in potassium, but calcium remains elevated. But that energy demand causes a state of metabolic acidosis and high lactic acid production. So that's, that's your very first step. <laughs> The other phenomenon that's occurring here is that very early on, you'll see a mismatch. This dotted line back here, down here, is the cerebral blood flow, and this line here is the glucose, glucose metabolism line. So there's this phenomenon of mismatch between cerebral blood flow and glucose metabolism. If you think of your energy demand being high, if there's a high demand for you know ATP pump and there's a high lactic acid, uh, production rate. Why there's a mismatch here, it's not very well understood. Um, but one of the things I wanted to point out is that it takes a significant amount of time before both the blood flow and the glucose line matches up. And it's at about 10 days. And you know, in, in some of the studies, it's even longer. It goes on and shows it's about 15, 30 days long and so on. The reason I'm talking about this timeline is very often you can have someone who's had Force concussion, they'll come into your clinic. Three to four days later, they'll tell you, hey, I, I'm fine, I don't have headache, I don't feel light headed, and I'm not conscious. But hopefully, you guys can see, see a paradox here, right? Clinically, an individual is saying that they don't have any neurological symptoms. On the other hand, the metabolic arrangement can persist 10 days and, and even longer. So, so that's kind of the early intermediate stage. A little bit later, at about maybe seven to 10 day process, that prolonged calcium elevation also causes uh, an inflammatory cascade and a set of cell death. The availability of calcium in extracellular space causes uh, neurofilament damage, uh, cell death, gliosis. From the top, right, potassium uh, elevation, then rapid rise in lactic acid, prolonged calcium, uh, presence in, in the cell body and cell damage. That's kind of the ballpark of the overall model. But once again, you know, clinically if an individual is not complaining of neurological symptoms. And keep in mind, at this time, there's no screening tool, there's no biomarker that will tell you that an individual's brain metabolism is too age for a prolonged period. So imagine having a second or a third concussion during this period of metabolism. It's kind of comparable to getting hit by a second tsunami or a second hurricane while you haven't recovered from the, from the first one. Um, so, you know, uh, that's, that's kind of a, a paradox that I, I think the scientific community is grappling with. How do, you, how do you really put together this difference between the amount of time it takes someone to clinically recover? In other cases, the clinical symptoms for some people can persist for months or uh, sometimes close to a year and so on. So we'll look at some of that a little while down the road. I think the concussion signs and symptoms, we can probably move forward pretty fast. You know, confusion, vacant stare, disorientation. In the past, loss of consciousness, I mean, I'm talking about 10 to 
years ago used to be included in the definition of sports concussion. That's no longer the case. I, I think I just wanted to drive home the point. You don't have to have a loss of consciousness in order for someone to have a, a concussion. Um, some of the intermediate symptoms for which often uh, patients come into a neurologist's office, and that's what I end up doing most of the time. My role often is either in a, in a sports medicine frontline setting where I'm in a game day situation or the day after the game, I'm looking at individuals with sports concussion symptoms, or two to four weeks later, individuals coming in with headache, dizziness, vertigo, nausea, and vomiting, and so on. You know, uh, and as far as time course goes, usually sleep disturbance, uh, reaction time, and balance are some of the symptoms that are last to resolve. So, so far, you have a historic context, you kind of have a physiological model, some of the signs and symptoms. Now, the next section of this talk, one really could probably compose one hour talk or one probably an entire conference on each one of these topics. But once again, you know, these are modules, kind of incorporate them into your day-to-day -day, uh, critical examination of concussion-related stories and so on. Uh, so we'll talk about testing and how is, how is concussion um, assessed. Um, and how many people here have heard of impact? Okay, about, about that, right? So even before, so there's five or six different things we'll talk about going forward, but there's this major need for both frontline and long-term assessment of concussion. And the question that I'm really putting forward to the whole group is to think critically about um, is there such a thing as, as a sports concussion assessment tool? In other words, it's, it's not like we can see, see concussion the way, same way you can see a fracture. So the majority of these assessment tools are actually assessing the signs and symptoms of concussion, and they're not necessarily diagnosing concussion. So that's an overarching thought I wanted to put out there. Um, has anyone here heard of SCAT, Sideline Concussion Assessment Test? So it's a very, very commonly used in, in sporting communities. And there's, I think it has a little bit more prevalence in, in the European uh, uh, sports medicine circles. Uh, but every four, four years, there's an international conference, and the questionnaire is really modified, but it's a 100-point questionnaire and set. It combines many of the aspects of neurological exam as a general questionnaire, combines signs, symptoms, Glasgow Coma Scale, uh, a MATIC score. In the sidelines, the questions are something like this. It says, hey, what venue are you in today? What half is it now? Who scored last in the game? Did your team win the game? And there's a point system. So the, those are the frontline questionnaire. And then eventually in the locker room, there's a set of other performance, the balance performance, and so on. And all of that combines to a 100, 100 point um, scoring system that's, that's tracked over time. And we'll get into some of that as well. But the other assessment tool, I think, that really has a lot of penetration in, in America, North America anyway, is impact. This is somewhat comparable to Headminder, Cogsport, some of the other products that, that, that have kind of have a widespread use in the market. But the story of how these assessment tools come about are just as interesting to me as the broad scale of utility of these tests, right? So I, I think it's worth sharing. Developed in early 90s by uh, a neurosurgeon and two neuropsychiatrists who are very closely uh, working with uh, universities. University of Pittsburgh and Pittsburgh Steelers football teams. So at that time, they, they, could hear, they could clearly see a demand for, there's a need for assessment of sports concussion, signs and symptoms, the psychological symptoms that, that keep coming up in the athletes. So this is what a typical score looks like. You know, memory composite, uh, both verbal, visual, motor speed, reaction time, and impulse control. You have a baseline and then multiple post control points. And this is what a typical impact uh, report looks like. Now, if you look at these five components, memory, memory, reaction time, motor speed, and so on, these components were really actually extracted from dimensional <coughs> you know, Typically, if somebody were to put out a drug um, for lowering cholesterol, you have to study the molecule, you have to put it through rigorous tests, somebody in FDA would look at multiple clinical trials, and so on. But I think one of the points I want you guys to take away is that no matter how widely impact is used, the test really comes about first the test is put out, and then secondarily, the data is collected on the uh, ability and, and reliability. So 
Also, no one owns the data for impact, so it's never centrally analyzed, locally analyzed, or processed. Once the questionnaire is administered, it kind of goes to a central database, and the report comes back to some sort of uh, handheld device or uh, a computer report, and so on. But as each test is being administered, the, that data is kind of kept centrally. And how, you know, what the trends are, it's somewhat of a proprietary uh, information. So it makes it somewhat challenging because despite how much coverage there is for sports and concussion, at this time, there's no national or statewide registry for really understanding what are some of the clinical signs and symptoms that really show up and what some of these, some of these trends are and so on. You know, if I were to summarize this whole dialogue, I would say, at least in the internal studies impact testing, they would have to say that you know it's reliable, it's valid. But the trend that I keep seeing, and perhaps many other people, who, if there are individuals here who kind of deal with um, sports concussion cases, I often find that an individual will do better after a concussion on any any one of those modules. Sometimes memory reaction time is better, and there are many reasons for this. It could be that. You know, initially when you take these tests, you're in a large cohort with your teammates, you're taking it quickly, and uh, after a concussion, you're motivated, you're focused. It could be that your concussion symptoms themselves, you know, your headache, your lack of sleep, could be affecting uh, the test results. It could be that this happens perhaps a little bit more in a pro sports setting. I actually don't find this to be the, the case in high school or college patients as much. But sometimes one could make the case that, you know, someone initially uh, didn't put in as much effort into this test so that the repeat concussion test score doesn't necessarily hold you back from going, going back to sport. Even though it's publicized by the media, I, I don't, in, in my personal experience, I don't find it to be true. In, in general, I think people do take this test with their, you know, with all the good intention and, and you know, might have happened in a, in a pro setting, but I think that's a very small subgroup of people. The larger issue with this test is that it's not consistently reliable. At least the patterns that come up, often we find that the patients are doing better after concussion compared to their baseline. So. Um, so another um, kind of large area of, of uh, concussion assessment is really balanced. So one of, one of the things that come up in sports concussion is that individuals can have prolonged uh, balance issues. So. Has, has anyone here who's played high school gone through the best testing? This is one of the baseline testing that's used to uh, do this. Uh, there's one guy here who's like, we had the impact testing. And, uh, okay, so the test is designed with uh, two, three different surfaces. So your baseline is on a firm concrete uh, surface. Then you get two different foams, medium density and firm. And then you're given three different stances. And then usually uh, someone is physiologically standing there and they're counting five, five different things. You know, how much, if you swing 15% from the midline, you know, if you, when you're asked to close your eyes, if you tip over, if there's greater than a certain degree of arm swing, someone's physically watching that and subtracting points. So your baseline score is 20, and as you make each one of these errors, uh, your score is subtracted, and this is, this is kind of tracked over time. The, the field has really now evolved to more of a handheld device where uh, either the iPhone gyroscope or the iPad, iPad gyroscope that can sense your motion. You have some companies that have developed apps to assess that. But this is, this is where it is. You know, like, this is exactly the state of science. We haven't gone to the point of saying, hey, if I have a cohort of 1,000 people on whom I have done you know, balance assessment, can we make some reasonable conclusions about what happens to balance in the short term and long term for concussed actions. This, this doesn't exist, which is the reason why it's so exciting to me because there's so many, so many un unanswered questions. But you know, throughout, for the rest of this talk, there's, you'll see a good number of commercial products mentioned and so on. I just want to say I don't have any uh, connection or anything to these commercial products, but the paradox in all of this is that the commercial market sees the need for a whole bunch of concussion assessment tools. So these products are hitting the market left and right. And at the same time, you know, we have very little data and very little evidence-based guidelines to connect how these assessment tools and what they, what they really tell us about uh, concussions in the, long, in the long run. So yeah, this is, I think this you'll hear about it. I think the newest iPad uh, commercial includes this, uh, at least I've seen it on TV. 
you strap on an iPad and you check your balance and so on. Um, so another area that I wanted to really highlight, I, I personally believe, I think there's a uh, major promise of eye tracking, right? So if we think about neural cognitive testing as a computer-based based test, once you start to move towards balance and eye tracking, there's a real search for physiological and biological markers for, for assessment of sports concussion. Um, uh, just a general principle on the thought, uh, and the basis for why we think eye, eye tracking is promising. You know, if you think of Roger Federer, or let's say a soccer goalkeeper who's trying to make a, a save, the margin of error for that individual to hit a tennis ball bat, which is coming at them at 100 miles per hour, is very little. It's 0.25 seconds. Any further delay would really make them either miss the shot or stop them from being able to save, save the penalty. So the part of the brain that's really involved in this, you, you need visual and then secondarily motor synchronization, right? So there's a certain amount of predictive timing that happens when it comes to tracking and, and, and reacting to things. The overall principle I think I just want to get across is that we feel that there is a real connection between the visual pathway and then the reaction time. And by tracking visual errors and so on, you may be able to say something specifically about concussions in the front lines or the prolonged, um, prolonged signs and symptoms. Uh, this is a study that's being done, uh, the ISIG testing. It's being done by the Department of Defense and Brain Health Foundation, a non-commercial study. So they, their starting point has been, hey, okay, let's get a large cohort of about 10,000 people, 5,000 military personnel, and 5,000 high school or collegiate athletes. And they're trying to do a very simple test. You take this red dot, and you follow it around a circle. And this test theoretically checks your visual and motor synchronization. Uh, two components to it. Initially, you're holding your gaze right there. So this is a normal individual, and this is someone who might have had brain trauma. This is the pilot, kind of an image of a, some of the pilot um, data from the military board, which is being completed. And I, I'm helping collect some of the data on the collegiate athletics and so on. Um, but you can see it's pretty difficult uh, immediately after head trauma for someone to kind of hold their gaze. And then moving forward, even some of the early pilot data here, for a normal individual, it might be pretty easy to follow a red dot around a circle, but by the time, you know, even some of the mild traumatic brain trauma cases, in the first 24 hours, you're starting to see a lot of variability in eye tracking. Um, so the goal here is really, in, instead of claiming, instead of claiming, hey, eye tracking is the end all and be all of everything, our goal really is to establish how much variability really makes a standard deviation, right? I think that's a good starting point, and that's, that's kind of the goal of this project. I'm excited, it's a pretty, um, you know, it's a non-commercial, large-scale study, and our goal is to establish just the variability after a comment, and from there, hopefully, we can establish standard deviations and costs and so on. Okay, here's another test, uh, another commercial product that's out there. It's been around since 1970s for, uh, it's developed by two optometrists for assessment of dementia, uh, sorry, uh, dyslexia, um, and then visual tracking. But it's starting to gain a pretty stronghold in, in the concussion field. Through marketing and through advocacy, you know, a good number of, there are certain counties throughout the US, in addition to impact testing, they're starting to utilize King David tests as part of a baseline concussion assessment. So the test goes simply, you get four cards, I kind of put them all on one screen. They're tiny numbers here, how close they're a little more visible. But the first card is a practice card. You follow these numbers across the table, table, right? And then the next three cards, you, you're supposed to read the numbers. There's two factors that are counted. Number one, the amount of time it takes to read the numbers and the number of errors. And that's tracked over time. Um, so another, another frontline test, uh, short. Quick. You, can, you can put it on a few index cards, and if eye tracking holds a lot of promise, I think one could make the case that okay, fine, there's uh, some, some sort of promise for using using a King David test and so on. I think there's a good number of, so for each one of those modules too, I have a good number of studies talking about their reliability and lack of reliability, but I think <laughs> our topic is robust enough. Let me introduce you guys to some of the other frontline assessment tools, and then I think it'll be fun to have some time for questions and, and, and so on. 
uh, from the audience. Uh, in general, this particular study was um, in a small cohort of mixed martial arts um, uh, fighters, you know, 39 individuals that used the King Devic test, you know, 24 hours post fight, seven days post fight, uh, consistently. The, the time it took to complete the King Devic test was prolonged. And I think some of, in some of the large scale, scale studies, the King Devic test is turning out to be uh, somewhat reliable and bound to market for concussion symptoms and so on. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, so now we're kind of getting to a little, even even something a little bit more advanced. Now, the, the next couple of assessment tools, it works well in a research setting, but the healthcare infrastructure, as well as for the general public, these tests are expensive. But at least, you know, this is this is part of the quest to figure out how can we assess force compassion, how can we assess brain harm. Um, anyone here of quantitative EEG? So basically, if you if you have a standard EEG and you look at the EEG screen, one could say, hey, that looks like a bunch of squiggly lines, right? So all of the squiggly lines are really frequency-based data, and the quantitative EEG creates a map of if your you know frequency of your brain wave is one hertz, that's right there, and then it, higher you get, higher frequency it gets, you know, you're looking at 25, 30, 40, and so on. So I think to simplify this quantitative EEG data. Green is good, red is bad, right? So typically, you know, most adult individuals have a posture economy of the 8 to 14 hertz range. And then the quantitative EEG can take a regular EEG and then create this graphic representation. So once you get up to the you know, 23, 24, 30, 40 range, it starts to show the region of the brain that's showing these high frequency waves. So the idea being that if, if you have a map off the brain that's showing uh, abnormal brain frequencies. You know, it, it hopefully gives you a vis visual representation of what and what the physiology, what's happening to the brain post post trauma. Um, you know, uh, the same uh, University of Pittsburgh and several other networks they've done some prolonged studies on quantitative EEGs, and it's turning out to be a pretty good correlation between uh, concussion and prolonged abnormalities in. In quantitative EEG, the other, the other, you know, holy grail really, you know, in the internal medicine world, I mentioned you guys do a lot of cardiac consults. Uh, you know, we look at CK as a biomarker. So there's been a little bit of a push to find out, you know, is there a biomarker for mild traumatic brain injury? You know, if you look at some papers, I, I just wanted to mention some of these. All of these molecules have been looked at and studied, but. Um, it's, there's nothing that is specific to source concussion per se. You know, apolipoprotein E, COMT, interleukin P53, ACE, SB100, all of these molecules, they're going to be elevated in severe traumatic brain injury as well as mild traumatic brain injury. So we don't have an answer for, you know, a single molecule, how long it might be elevated post, post concussion. But to keep in mind that there is a little bit this body of work that there's it's a little bit of a holy cow because if you find a biomarker that's sensitive and specific to mild traumatic brain injury, at least you have something there. But then still secondary, the question will remain: how do you justify the cost of this? The cost of actually, you know, using it in the front line, unless someone comes up with a very cheap and easy, easy to easy to use way uh, to analyze this. Um, the other promising area really is. Um, you know, once again, it's very expensive for, uh, it, it's specifically the DTI sequence within, within, the, within neuroimaging. So diffusion tensor imaging looks, looks at your uh, white matter tracks, and very often uh, the frontal area, the visual areas, you know, it starts to show abnormalities post-trauma. So neuroimaging studies, they, we've already known that from severe traumatic brain injury. Now people are starting to look at whether mild traumatic brain injury and DTI studies actually correlate and actually add up. And you know, many hospitals don't necessarily have this particular sequence in order to do that study. You have to have an extra MRI time. So you can imagine, you know, if you have a high school team that reports a high school athletic team that has 500 athletes, and per season if there's 100 concussion, you know, it's not quite practical. But at least. You know, the, the search is on for see if there's a quick MRI sequence that can, that can tell us a little bit more about, about sports concussion. 
So thanks for listening to me. Thanks for the world and tour through you know this uh, topic that seems to be a hot topic. You know, to summarize from the top, we, we looked at neuropathology slides. We looked at um, a pathophysiological model for pain trauma. We've mentioned the scan testing, impact testing, king data testing, biomarker, and neuroimaging. So this is this is kind of a, uh, a report on the, the state of the state of the field, and you know where we go from here is very exciting because I think there's an incredible number of unanswered questions. Um, I, I purposefully wanted to leave a little time, you know. Oh, and, and yes, right. This is my little guy. His name is Rehan, and people always ask me, you know, "Hey, you know, are you going to let your kids play sports and so on?" You know, I, I box. I go to a boxing gym. You know, he, he runs around. I think he fell on this day. We were in San Antonio. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, sports are, are part of our lives, and, and I, I think I think people should compete and participate in sports. You know, but we have to ask the right questions and make the right right changes and so on. So with that, I'll open up the floor to questions. I think we have questions in the back. Yeah, one thing you haven't touched on is prevention. Um, you know, obviously we have a lot of kids in our community playing sports, uh, specifically soccer. We see a lot of these kids starting with the head gear. Yeah. Is there any uh, evidence that they're effective uh, in yeah. prevention? Specifically for soccer, I'll say this. The U.S. Uh, they have a small project for U.S. soccer where um, we there's a specific uh, gel cushion helmet gear that has come about, and some of the MLS players that have used it, uh, there was no evidence that it's more protective against concussion. That you know, individuals who wore it, um, that they, they sustain equal, equal time of concussion. So for soccer, I think it's, it's a very, it, the question is two levels. Number one, you know, using your head is an integral part of the game. You score goals with your head, right? That's one. And then number two is there, um, Unlike a helmet, can you use something that is going to protect you? Uh, you know, um, I think the first question. You know, uh, I, I'm not sure how how a rule change about not using a head in soccer how that will go over with soccer like community. And that, number two, so far there is no idea that's been shown to be protected in soccer. Yes. So, do you think there's value to using impact tests? Yeah, the question is, do I think there's a value to being <laughs> Without ruffling feathers and offending a lot of people, uh, the only time I find this test helpful is when an individual is completely free of clinical symptoms. Let's say someone's come in and said, hey doc, my headache's gone. I feel great. I want to go back to sports. Uh, I've done a project at Columbia during throughout my residency. We had 460. Uh, football players. Seventy of them had concussions over the course of eleven seasons, and about twenty-nine of them showed significant decline in those neurocognitive um, markers, even when they reported that they were no symptoms. So the point is, it might be helpful when somebody's reporting, "Hey, I have no more symptoms," but you might be able to pick up subtle neurocognitive uh, deficits. By the way, in that case, the baseline is not really helpful. Like I, I don't know what the baseline means. I mean, comparing it to the baseline doesn't mean anything to me. But if someone's saying, hey, my symptoms are completely gone, I, I think a neurocognitive test can be helpful because you can at least look at some sort of uh, representation of their reaction time that way. Once again, this is my personal opinion, and hopefully you know, that answers your question. And then what do you do with that? Um, you, you may consider, you have to put it together with their sleep habit and headache. You may consider not returning that kind of sport. Even though they're, they're clinically, it depends on the level of their severity, you know, and, you know, I mean, hey, are they really. I, I have no reason to think someone would bump the test on purpose if they really trying to go back to sports. Yes? Um, returning to play and resting after the concussion. Some people say you need to rest and stay away from all screens and try to rest and keep avoiding academics. And some people say you do what you can and if you get a headache, then back off. Yes. So complete resting versus some work make any difference in their recovery? Yeah, the question is about how you can rest and recover from concussion. So, two things. Um, I think that. Single most factor that we found most effective for concussion recovery is sleep. Now, let's be real. A full cognitive rest, I have in in the time of text messages, iPad, iPhone, 
you know, internet connected TVs, it's very, very difficult for anyone, forget a teenager, any adult, any resident, any physician, you know, we're constantly wired. It's very difficult to get full cloud and invest. I don't even expect that to be the reality if I were to prescribe this to someone and say, hey, go home and take full cloud and invest. So what I say is that your sleep time, let's increase your sleep time. So bed by eight. And then uh, for return sports, I kind of do a gradual, gradual strategy where the first two to three weeks they may start going to school at around 11. They give them some time in the morning to discuss the easy, and then kind of move that up to nine and then in a regular time. So I think focusing on sleep perhaps is more realistic compared to full on talk and invest. I just don't mind that. Yes? If you don't have the impact test, then um, is there any criteria for, like right now, using like seven days after they don't have a headache? And the other question is, have you done any studies or looked at any of the humanity that they're using in Pittsburgh to see if they? Would you repeat the second part of the question? Sorry. Um, the amantadine, if they, if that helps them recover faster. Yes. So uh, let me answer the first part of your question. Seven. Your question was about and being it, symptom free for seven, seven days, days, right? So I look at that in conjunction with dynamic data. So the return to play guidelines usually will say there are six stages. Uh, one of the early stages include your level of exercise tolerance. You're asked to do cardiovascular exercise for 20 minutes. So the, one of the questions and data points I look at, and some sports neurology clinics that you're starting to have a treadmill or a station bike right, right there in the clinic that's actually the available CPT code. Um, so does a person's symptom return when, when they start doing active or maybe some light sports specific exercises? I mean, if they're tolerating that I, at this point, you know, given that there's no molecular biomarker, I'm, I'm doing it enough to start returning to this sport. And the usage of Amanti, I, I have used it and I find it useful. I, I don't know of any large scale study that has definitively shown Amanti that's useful for cognitive recovery, but I find it helpful. Say, as opposed to, as an alternative to so many of the high school athletes, at least in my Columbia cohort, 20% of the athletes had either ADHD and some good number of them were on ADHD medications. So if somebody's having cognitive difficulty, there's a problem with putting them on a stimulant medication when sleep is so integral to your recovery. So as an alternative to ADHD and stimulant, stimulant medication, I will I will reach for a natural you know, I, I don't put anybody on any sort of stimulant medication even though they're having cognitive difficulties, most concussion. All right, well, thank you very much.